what did Moses do that caught the eye of the daughters of Rule, also known as Jethro? Help get water for the sheep. The daughters went home. They told their father what had happened, that, that they were about to get run off from the watering hole, and this man um, helped them. It ends up with Moses marrying Zipporah, daughter of Jethro. And so for the next 40 years, what's Moses going to do? He's going to be a shepherd. He's going to tend his father-in-law's flock. He's going to do those things that shepherds do, which are what, by the way? Because we need to understand the setting of what Moses is about to spend these next 40 years ruminating on, learning from, being in the middle of. Where is Moses' office going to be? Just out, okay? What, who's he going to be with? Any other human contact? Moses is about to spend a lot of time by himself. He's going to be out. I don't know. I mean, I can relate to it, not in the, in the terms of shepherd, but I know that I do my best critical thinking when I'm by myself in a deer stand, when I'm by myself on the lawnmower, when I'm, you get the point. We all do that way, right? We, we get somewhere and we get out and it's just us and whatever and thoughts start flowing and we start analyzing things and just uh, inner peace or however you want to call it. Do you think perhaps that happened to Moses during these next 40 years? Well, he had plenty of time to be by himself. Just him and the sheep and out he went. Verse 24. <clears throat> So God heard the groaning, and God remembered His covenant with Abraham, with Isaac, and with Jacob. And God looked upon the children of Israel, and God acknowledged them. Did God ever really forget? What was the plan all along? Moses? Egypt? Leave? Pardon, Bill? Bill's comment is it's God's plan and God's time, and no one else knew what the time frame was. No one else knew, and it didn't matter, did it? In the 90s, I went to Russia, oh, well, the former Soviet Union, Belarus specifically, and I was surprised to find out that those people had a saying, and it was beautiful the way they delivered it, and I can't remember it in, in Belarusian, but it, they would shrug the shoulders and say, God knows. And that was their response to just so many things. Well, uh, what's going to happen to such a... God knows. Wonderful way of looking at it, isn't it? How do we... What's the plan? What do I have problems with? I need to control things. Do you have that problem? Maybe, sometimes. What was Moses in control of? During these 40 years in the wilderness, he was in control of a bunch of sheep. How is that going to be training for what the 40 years that were about to, to follow from, from age 80 to age 120? How do, we go, how do we get from a herd of sheep to 2 million Jews? wandering through the wilderness. <laughs> the, the, uh, the comment is, whose voice was it that was talking to Pharaoh? It was God's voice through Moses, not Moses' voice. Bill? <laughs> Bill said the sheep didn't talk back. Yeah. Trish's, Trish's comment is, there was another shepherd that we know very well, and that was David. And, and look at the things he did in his life. 
and those, those times that he spent also just tending those sheep in the qualities that it gave him in order to be the king that he was. What's another word for elders? Not used specifically to identify one, but as an analogy in Scripture. Shepherds. Okay? So is there, is there, tra- or is there learning? Absolutely. All right, chapter 3. Well, you know how old he is from Acts chapter 7, verse 30. At this point, when we go to the burning bush, he's 80 years old. Who wants to get a new job at age 80? Les, what was it like 10 years ago when you were 80? <laughs> you know, Les hammered me this morning. He said, Richard, I remember class last week. Was it Wednesday or Sunday? <laughs> All right, who wants to take a new job at age 80? We're looking for retire. Aren't we still looking to get the Social Security check at age 80 for the most part? You know, it, he's going to spend the next 40 years doing this. He comes across what? We know it. What does he see that catches his attention? The burning bush. What's important about, or, or what's unique about the burning bush? It's burning and it's continually burning. Right? Now, Debbie and I just spent the entire week with all the grandkids at Disney. There was a lot of fire in a lot of different places. What fed it? Because I sat outside every evening at a little fire pit that burned and burned and burned and burned, and guess what? The logs never burned up. It was gas-fed, right? That, so, would the skeptic say, well, there was a hole in the ground with a natural gas vent hole right there under that bush? No, the bush didn't burn. God created the bush, put the bush there and put the fire in it in order to attract Moses' attention. And Moses came over to it because this was a miraculous event. This was something that defied the laws of nature, that contradicted the laws of nature. And God put it there in order to confirm who, what? that he was God, and he was talking to Moses. Uh, Chapter 3, Now Moses was tending the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian. He led the flock back to the desert. He came to Horeb, the mountain of God. And that's where the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire in the midst of the bush. So he looked, and behold, the bush was burning with fire, but the bush was not consumed. Then Moses said, I will turn aside and see this great sight, why the bush does not burn. So when the Lord saw that Moses turned aside, he called to him from the midst of the bush, Moses, Moses, and he said, here I am. Were there some uh, restrictions here as Moses was to approach the bush? He was supposed to take off his shoes because he was on holy ground. Is that important? Sometimes I overlook little things, and I, I'm not going to spend a great deal of time here, but in the presence of God, what did that make everything that was around where God's presence was? Okay? The lesson to be learned as far as respect goes, you know, we're in worship service. Who's here with us? How, how are we to show our respect to God? I mean, in this way, Moses was required to take off his sandals before he approached it. Is there a lesson to be learned for us whenever we're near God, how we go to God in prayer, how we worship as, as we're here as a corporate body? And I think so. So we won't dwell any further on that. But just these little things that we see, God, that wasn't just a burning bush. That was God. And we know, of course, later in the wilderness as God went up on the mountain to be close to God, what did he have to do? Or how did it, um, how did he appear after he had been with God? Glowing. And he he had to look at the back of God. Couldn't even look at the face of God. All right? Um, Moses seems to have a problem with what the job is that he's about to be given. Verse 11. 
But Moses said to God, Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and that I should bring the children of Israel out of Egypt? Now, in what is a uh, recurring theme, as we get into this job that Moses has to do, what was Moses ready to do at age 40? It appeared that he was ready to lead in his mind. Remember what we read last week with that little blurb out of Josephus that indicated that perhaps Moses had been told by his father that you know, he was going to have a great job in front of him and so on and so forth? And that we look in Acts chapter 7 and there's some indication that Moses expected a different reaction from the Hebrew when he killed the Egyptian than what he got. At age 40, full of vim and vigor, what was he ready to do? Take on the world. At age 80, is is his attitude a little different? Why? What? Is he, a, is he scared? Is he afraid? Why do we make excuses about what we're not capable of, typically? What? We're afraid. We're afraid to step out. Going back to that kind of example I I talked about earlier, at age 40, how did you feel ready? As time goes on, do we all become a little more, not not as sure of ourselves as we were at a younger age? You know, at, at age 30 to 40, you're bulletproof. Nothing, nobody can hurt you. You can do anything you want to. You... You're an idiot, you're stupid, but, and I'm, I didn't mean you are, I meant I am. We all were. But at age, and then as time goes on, you, you know, I could have done that 10 years ago. I'm not so sure I want to jump on that right now. Well, in some things, that's a good thing, because some of the things that you were willing to do at age 40 really were stupid and shouldn't have been attempted. Uh, thankfully, God gave us blessed us enough to get us through whatever that situation was and we're here today. Now Moses suddenly is a little reluctant to go do the job. Now we paint Moses in a certain picture. We paint him as someone who was really just not confident, not sure, didn't want to do the job. In all of this next chapter or two as he's telling God, I don't know what to say, I don't know how to do it. Gary? Gary's point is 40 years of sheep shepherding might have have placed a different perspective in Moses' mind that made him reluctant to go back and deal with 2 million Jews. Look in Numbers chapter 12, verse 3. I overlook this a lot of times when I'm thinking about Moses. Let me, st- and do you remember when Aaron and Miriam got into a little spat about Moses? This is then. Numbers chapter 12, verse 3. Now the man Moses was very humble, more than all men who were on the face of the earth. Hmm. What does that give us when it comes to Moses' attitude when he's standing before God and when he's thinking about the job that's at hand? What did Moses get during those 40 years in the wilderness? Humility. Is there a lesson there? Does God 
need a man of humility in order to lead his people out of Egypt? He sure does. How many different attitudes are you going to have to deal with? How are you going to deal with them? You are not going to deal with them because it is I, Moses, that am leading these people out of Egypt. You're going to be able to deal with them because it is I, Moses, being backed up by God and doing the work or doing the things that God tells me to do. It is Moses who is going to be a facilitator for God. And there's a vast difference between Moses, the leader, the general, the, the age 40, kill the Egyptian attitude, and there is in the 80 year old Moses as to who really is in charge. A man of great humility, like none in all the world. So when we see Moses with this somewhat reluctant attitude, we hammer him pretty hard because, come on, Moses, you know what uh, you were born to do. You know what the job is. Step up and do it and quit making excuses. Well, what else do we know? Whole big picture, right? We're a little unfair, perhaps, sometimes to Moses. We want to say, come on, Moses, you know what the deal is here. Let's go. Verse 13, back to Exodus chapter 3, verse 13. Then Moses said to God, Indeed, when I come to the children of Israel and I say to them, The God of your fathers has sent me to you, and they say to me, What is his name? What shall I say to them? And God said to Moses, I am who I am. And thus you shall say to the children of Israel, I am has sent me to you. All right, we're focusing on what Moses has to do as far as dealing or interfacing with the Egyptians. Who's the other group of people that Moses has to convince first to follow him out the front door? His fellow Jews, the Hebrews. And the last time he left, they were no more enamored with him than were the Egyptians. So we got two groups of people that Moses has got to deal with from two different directions. When he goes back, do you think they're going to remember who he was? This is 40 years later. Some might. How is he going to, where is his in? Who does he need to talk to first before he talks to the the masses. The elders. He's got to talk to the elders. <clears throat> You've got a group of people, <clears throat> and those people are governed by a smaller group of people. Where are you going to go first in order to um, get your in? Talk to the elders of the tribes. Who do, who do you have to convince first? those people, then they are going to help you convince all the rest as to exactly who Moses is. Um, verse 18, still in chapter 3, well, 16, go and gather the elders of Israel together, say to them, the Lord God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob appeared to me saying, and he said, I, uh, verse 18, then they will heed your voice and you shall come and the elders of Israel to the king of Egypt, and you shall say to him, etc., and so on. Um, verse 19, I think, is something that, to me, I overlook a lot and is a key. We, we know the terminology that's used in the Scripture as to Pharaoh's heart is what? How was it? It was a hardened heart. And there's reference that God... As, as God puts it in the scripture in talking to Moses, I will harden his heart. What shape was Moses' heart already in? I'm sorry, Pharaoh's heart already in. <clears throat> it was there, wasn't it? Verse 19, what does God know about Pharaoh's heart? But I am sure that the king of Egypt will not let you go. no. Not even by a mighty hand. What does God know? Does God have to harden Pharaoh's heart any more than it's already hardened? 
What is God doing through Pharaoh? God is working His plan through an evil man. Have we seen this before? Is this unusual? Has it happened? Will it happen? Has God used all kinds of people in order to further His plan? What's Pharaoh going to do? Pharaoh eventually is going to let the Israelites go. There's going to have to be several lessons that are going to take place before he does that. Do you think Pharaoh is going to get it on the first lesson or it's going to take more? For that matter, do you think the children of Israel are going to get it on the first lesson or is it going to take more? Pardon? A lot more. It absolutely is. But his heart, and I think sometimes we make too much of the term that God will harden his heart, uh, harden Pharaoh's heart. Um, Pharaoh's heart was pretty hard. We have to get to Pharaoh's break point. We have to get to the Isra uh, Israelites' rally point, And God is going to allow Pharaoh to be Pharaoh. Verse 21. I skip this one a lot of times too. And I will give this people... Favor in the sight of the Egyptians, and it shall be when you go that you shall not go empty-handed. Hmm. Israel was given their release papers, but these release papers were not simply to gather their belongings and go out the front door of Egypt. They were going to pillage the bank account and take the majority of the bank of Egypt with them. What was going to be necessary for their sustenance and survival for the next 40 years? They weren't going to do it on strawless bricks, were they? They were going to need gold, silver, livestock, and all manner of other things. Where did they get all of those livestock, those animals that they uh, sacrificed on a daily ba basis for 40 years in the wilderness? There was a lot of a lot of requirements, I guess, is the best way of putting it as we go through those next 40 years. They were taking the best that Egypt had to go with them. Chapter 4, <clears throat> verses 3, 6, and 9, God shows Moses what he needs to show the elders of the tribes when he gets there. Remember what those are? Verse 3, what was the first one and probably the most famous, the one that we all know because we talk about it in vacation Bible school and all those other stories all the time. The staff, Moses' staff. And what was that staff going to do? He was going to throw it on the ground. It was going to become a snake. And then when he picked it up by the tail, what happened? Okay, it became a staff again. How do you feel about snakes? Would you, would you want to pick it up by the tail? Would, if you threw it down, it became a snake. Would you want to pick it back up? What were snakes to Egyptians? Do we know? I mean, we, Egyptians had a lot of other things, did they not? As far as symbols, especially dogs. They have all kinds of things. Anything from the animal kingdom or animal world has special meaning to a lot of different, different people. Egyptians were no exception to that. But this was just a piece of miracle that God was going to perform, allow Moses to it. Do you think it impressed Moses? Seems to. All right. Verse 6, what else? What else did he show Moses? Chapter 4, verse 6. Furthermore, the Lord said to him, Put your hand in your bosom. And he put his hand in his bosom. And when he took it out, behold, his, land, his hand was leprous like snow. Verse 9. And it shall be that they do not believe these two signs or listen to your voice, that you shall take water from the river and pour it on dry land. The water which you take from the river will become blood on dry land. Now, the staff and the... the Leprous hand are issues for the elders. The staff obviously was shown to Matthew. Uh, Pharaoh, 
Time out. Actually, there was a purpose to that. I, I almost lost my voice last week. I can't talk for 40 minutes anymore. And I'm, I have my coffee with me. Don't feel or don't think badly of me. I'm not trying to sneak a bit of caffeine. I'm trying to keep my, fo my throat dry to make it through the class. But I told Debbie I was bringing that in with me this morning, and she didn't stop me, so I assumed it was okay. Um, the leper's hand, or the, the staff and the, uh, turning into a snake he's going to show to Pharaoh. There's going to be a, a um, plague that has to do with the blood, so we've got that there. Moses is going to identify these things, and with that he's going to gain the understanding and the respect of the elders. Verse 16. God, or Moses is still a little reluctant, and God gets angry. Verse 15, rather. Now you shall speak to him and put words in his mouth, and I will be with your mouth and, and with his mouth, and I will teach you what to say, so he shall be your spokesman to the people. We're talking about Aaron. Uh, and I will teach you what you shall do. Why is Moses still to this point? You would think he gets it, but he doesn't. So Aaron's going with him. Now, verse 23, verse actually 22, 23, um, let's back up to 21. There's an interesting story here. The meat of the story is only three verses long. It's a story that we, that we gloss over, that we skip on, well, I skip it all the time because I don't really understand it, truthfully. But it's here, and we know that all Scripture is given to us that which is profitable for teaching, etc., and so on, it's here for a reason. God does not put superfluous words in Scripture. We know that. Why is this story here? Well, go with me and start in verse 21. And the Lord said to Moses, When you go back to Egypt, see that you do all these wonders before the Pharaoh, which I have put in your hand. I will harden his heart so that he will not let the people go. Then you shall say to Pharaoh, Thus says the Lord, Israel is my son, my firstborn. So I say to you, my son, that he may serve me. Let my son go that he may serve me. But if you refuse to let him go, indeed, I will kill your son, your firstborn. We know this, right? I mean, that this is the final straw that finally gets Pharaoh to let the Israelites go. All right, God's telling Moses, here in this circumstance, this is what you're going to tell Pharaoh. Firstborn, my child, what really hits home to us? The death of a child, our child, the death of any child. I can't imagine it to be the death of my child. I've been told by people who have lost children, it's the most pain they can possibly feel. I pray it doesn't happen to me. But everyone I've known that has had it happen says it's almost inconsolable. Should Pharaoh understand it? He should. You think Moses understands it? Hopefully. Verse 22. Verse 20, um, 24. And it came to pass, and we jump from there. We've had this, this lesson from God to Moses, and now suddenly, out of the blue, and it came to pass on the way at the encampment that the Lord met him and sought to kill him. Who? Who? Kill who? Who are we talking about? Wait a minute. What happened? Moses was in the presence of God. He was having conversation with him about the job at hand. Now all of a sudden God wants to kill Moses? Verse 25. Then Zipporah took a sharp stone and, cast off the, and cut off the foreskin of her son and cast it at Moses' feet and said, Surely you are a husband of blood to me. So he let him go. Then she said, You are a husband of blood because of the circumcision. And then we're right back to discussion about freeing the children of Israel. Wow, did that just happen? Did God just tell Moses or did God just threaten to take Moses' life right before he was about to go into Egypt and take the children of Israel out? He did. Now, I'll give you a little bit of warning here. If you go look this up in the commentaries, 
you're going to find a lot of stuff. <laughs> you're going to find that God was not really trying to kill Moses. He was trying to kill Moses' son. Okay? I'm not sure you can support that, but you're going to find it. So what's the deal? Why? What had happened here? We're left to speculate as to the reason. It, it appears to be because Moses had not circumcised his son. How was this in the eyes of God? What had God told them to do, and what was the sign? Go back to Genesis chapter 17. Verses 13 and 14. He who is, Genesis chapter 17, verse 13. He who is born in your house and he who is bought with your money must be circumcised. My covenant shall be in your flesh for an everlasting covenant. And the uncircumcised male child who is not circumcised in the flesh of his foreskin, that person shall be cut off from his people. He has broken my covenant. Is it pretty serious? Well, could God have Moses going before Pharaoh representing God when all of the rules had not been followed? Apparently not. And God came to Moses and was going to just stop it right here. Now, does that mean if he had that the children of Israel would not have left Egypt? I would argue that it does not, because if Moses had not been able to lead them, somebody else would have. What else does that tell us about sometimes our feeling of superiority or the fact that we think we're indispensable or we can't be touched for a certain thing? Was Moses indispensable? Was Moses a great man? Did Moses do God's job? Was Moses indis indispensable? Doesn't look like it here. Chuck, did you have something to say? He, God, let him go. So God let him go. God relented and chose not to kill him. Zipporah took care of the action. All right? Um, I wish I knew what transpired exactly. Uh, I don't. I don't know how to take it. It's an unusual story. It's right there in the middle of all this, and it's just kind of thing. But yeah, God knows. We don't. Steve. summarized what Steve said was if you're going to represent God you have to represent him in all respects and you have to follow all the rules and you have to be the the emissary that according to the protocol that God set forward verse 29 and thir or 30 and 31 Moses and Aaron went and gathered the elders together 31 so the people believed and when they heard that the Lord had visited the children of Israel and had looked upon their affliction, they bowed their heads and worshiped. All right, we've got phase one done. The elders understand, and they're on board with Moses and Aaron. Now we're about to go to Pharaoh. That's where we'll get to next week, um, chapters 5 through 12. Okay? Thank you.